I think I will start just welcoming everyone, whatever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us today. I, I am Andrea Diaz de Soyano. I'm the Director of Philanthropy Partnerships and Engagement Team at Atlantic College. We are really delighted to launch this new series of, of talks. And as part of our engagement strategy, we wanted to give you another platform where you could give back your time and talent. So we're hoping to have more and more speakers joining us in, in this new series. So I will leave you now with uh, my colleague Keith, who will explain to you how, how this event will work and will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Hi, th thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we're actually really excited to get this kicked off um, and we're really lucky today. We've got Dr. Pedro Alonso, who, who's been, who we're lucky enough has is, is got the time to, to join us and sort of have a talk on, I guess, sort of looking at past and present pandemics. Um, he's currently the director of the WHO's Global Malaria Program. So he's, he, he's really involved in what's going on at the moment. And as I said, he, he's one of our very well-known alumni. So we're, we're really lucky and excited to have. Um, I guess in terms of sort of the format of, of today's talks, um, Dr. Lonzo will, will give sort of a, a 15, 20 minute talk. Um, and then we'll follow that up with a, a quick sort of well, a, a Q&A section after that. We're, we've received in a few questions via email um, and we'll share sort of a few more will we'll come out throughout the talk. We'll, we'll try to respond to sort of six or seven um, and sort of go from there. When you share your questions, uh, we'll unmute you so that you can sort of have a ask your question directly to Dr. Lonzo. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll sort of go from there. And this is, I guess, the event shouldn't last more than a, about an hour. Um, a few, I guess, sort of admin things, if you could. Um, if you're able to sort of re rename yourself to sort of whether you're an alumni, whether you're a parent, um, as well as if you got, you can put your class name, uh, that'd be really helpful so we just have an idea. Um, and yeah, in terms of sort of questions along the bottom, uh, there's a chat box. If you have any questions that come up, just pop them in there um, and we'll make a note of them so that we can share them with, with Pedro after this. Um, so yeah, really happy to pass this on to uh, Pedro now and sort of get this all kicked off. Um, thanks for joining us and we're really excited to begin. Thanks. Uh, Pedro, uh, over to you now. Thank you. Thanks. Can, can you hear me? Just to check on that. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. So, uh, dear colleagues and friends and UW series, uh, very happy to be with you uh, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you may be in whatever time zone you may be in. I was first asked about this last week by my dear friend and, and uh, year made Jan Petit. And as whenever Jan asks me something, I always end up doing. So I'm delighted to be here with, uh, with you today. So I'll briefly speak about um, uh, pandemics, a brief history of pandemics and um, and uh, and then I'll move on to malaria, which is probably the mother of all pandemics, and uh, tell you a little bit where we are today in the fight against malaria, as well as the potential impact of COVID-19 on our global fight against malaria. So uh, a, a few words on history, uh, and I've chosen just um, five of the big pandemics that have shaped world history but uh, of course there are there are uh, there are many many others and um, I've chosen these five because they probably help uh, highlight some uh, of the key uh, elements of how mankind has evolved and how we've learned and what we've uh, been able to do to um, to uh, control these pandemics in as much as possible. So perhaps just starting with the uh, Justinian plague of um, um, caused by Yersinia pestis, transmitted through the fly, fleas and black rats were, black rats were, it is estimated that somewhere around 30 to 50 million people died, which probably at that time constituted about half of the world population. And of course, plague never left uh, Europe, and uh, and as such, uh, we then had the uh, the 
Black Death uh, epidemic of 1347, um, which again wiped out a, a significant proportion of uh, Europe's population. And the reason why I'm highlighting it now is because the term quarantine was uh, uh, first uh, conceived uh, uh, at that point, the intervention, and thus the name, by um, Venetians who um, used it as isolation first in boats and then um, the Trentino, and then that led to the Quarantino, uh, which is where the term quarantine comes from. Again, plague uh, never left, and uh, a very famous one was the Great Plague of uh, London of 1665, where in just seven months about 100,000 Londoners died. And uh, the interesting thing here is that probably that was the first time when victims were shut down into homes, red crosses were painted, public entertainment was stopped, and I'm sure that some of these things do resonate with uh, what is going on right now. Smallpox, and smallpox has been with us for a long time, but uh, when it was first introduced into the Americas, when first the Europeans got there, it is said, and the estimates there vary a lot, uh, about 90% of the American uh, population actually died. And of course, I now bring this uh, to, um, to light because it was uh, around smallpox that the first vaccine developed by the gentleman they have there in the picture, Mr. Jenner, in 1796, first developed um, um, the uh, immunization against smallpox with cowpox and uh, a pretty efficacious uh, uh, mode of prevention and therefore the, the mother of, of modern vaccines. And then the second uh, map I put underneath was that within seven years, in this case, the Spanish crown organized a global expedition, what was then termed the first philanthropic expedition, sorry, that was my phone, it should be off, uh, to disseminate uh, this vaccine or this mode of immunization to every corner of the world, and at that time specifically, most of uh, central parts of North America and, and South America, but was then known the, the Palmis expedition. And thus, I think the point to retain here is uh, vaccines were developed and were very quickly disseminated across the world. Now, the fifth example I'll use is the one of uh, cholera, uh, which again has been present with us um, for many centuries, but the outbreak of cholera, again in London in the late 19th century, um, in many ways has often been considered as the birth of modern epidemiology and mo modern public health by uh, Mr. John Snow and the pump in Broad Street. He used for the first time detailed mapping of where cases were taking place and eventually identified what he thought was the source of uh, the infection a pump in a small street in London, which he then went on to remove from there. So, pandemics is nothing new to us as mankind. We've been seeing it, we've been suffering them, and we will continue suffering them for a long time. A couple of examples. The first uh, uh, picture on the top is Camp Funston in Kansas, US, 1918. Um, there is uh, still discussion as to where did the so-called Spanish flu start, which of course it was not in Spain, it was actually probably in, in Kansas. Uh, but it was called Spanish flu because the largest number of cases were being reported from Spain, who at that time during World War I was neutral in the war, and thus there was a lot more freedom for uh, expression and reporting. Uh, not that the, 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 the epidemic, the pandemic, effectively was born in, in, in Spain. But interestingly, the picture of those hospitals and the bottom picture is indeed a hospital just outside Madrid during the current COVID-19 uh, epidemic, which makes you think, well, things haven't really changed a lot in a hundred years. But of course they have. And uh, what has changed is that there is the power of science to within 
weeks, if not days, of uh, the first cluster of cases in China of COVID-19 being identified. The virus was identified by a Chinese scientist. Uh, its full uh, genome was sequenced and shared in near real time. And as such, um, uh, diagnostics tests were could be developed again within days. Um, and uh, within um, probably a couple of weeks, the first uh, uh, efforts to start developing vaccines um, started. Now we have at least 40 reasonably solid vaccine candidates in development. There are over 500 clinical trials ongoing around the world looking for a new um, uh, or use of uh, different um, drugs for the treatment and prevention of um, COVID-19 infection. And so um, we are reasonably confident that um, with time, and hopefully uh, not a lot of time, um, uh, tools, uh, therapeutics, uh, vaccines will be available. And that's a very sharp contrast to where we were just over a hundred years ago, even if the pictures look reasonably um, similar. Let me move over to malaria because, of course, malaria has been uh, 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 an ongoing pandemic for, for uh, thousands of years and indeed has shaped world history. And let me just give you a few examples. Some people say that Alexander the Great died of malaria, but I don't think so. Uh, but uh, one could be a lot more certain or believe it much more likely that Sandro Guest Augustine, the first Archbishop of Canterbury in 40 and 430 after death died of malaria as um, surely did Dante Alighieri and Lord Byron. Uh, Lord Byron as he was uh, um, uh, fighting in, uh, in what is now Macedonia or in North Greece. I'm actually not entirely sure if it's Macedonia or North Greece or the Macedonian part of, uh, of Greece in 1824. Russian Emperor Peter the Great did not die of malaria, but a very large number of his troops did so in the Iran campaign in 1720, even though he had actually banned them from um, eating watermelons, which he thought was the cause of that massive mortality that his troops had, which of course was not watermelons, but was rather malaria. Oliver Cromwell did die of malaria, and his physicians told him that um, he could be cured if he took the the powder of the cinchona, the, the bark, uh, as Peruvian tree, which was um, under the monopoly of the Spanish Jesuits, and he therefore refused to take it, and, um, and thus he died of malaria. And so did the Emperor Charles I of Spain and the V of Germany, and a very large number of popes, including Gregorius V, the reformist, Damaso II, uh, only three weeks after being elected, he was probably infected the day he was elected. Uh, Alexander VI, who has gone into history as the most corrupt pope in history. Leon uh, X and VI, uh, the V. And of course, the most unfortunate one was Giambattista Castana, who was elected as Urban VII, but died actually before taking office in 1590. And of course, a good number of US presidents suffered from malaria. None died as far as we know, but that certainly included George Washington, Monroe, Jackson, Lincoln, Grant, Garfield, Roosevelt, uh, and, um, and John F. Kennedy during, his, uh, during World War II. So malaria has been with us and has had a profound impact on our history. And this picture, which again looks pretty much like some of the ones we've seen before, both of COVID-19 or of uh, of uh, the Spanish flu of 1918 is again a, a, a military hospital in Macedonia, um, uh, close to where Lord Byron died. Um, and although it was a military hospital, this one, um, more than 90% of the casualties were actually due to malaria and not to, um, to um, the consequences or the direct consequences of war. Ronald Ross, the man depicted in this uh, um, uh, um, uh, picture, got his Nobel Prize in 1906 as, uh, uh, for his um, discovery, together with uh, another Italian scientist, of uh, the transmission of malaria 
by um, anopheline mosquitoes. But the point about showing or sharing this graph is, is uh, how it actually captures not just the health impact of malaria and the malaria pandemic, but the indirect consequences that this has in terms of the economic and social development of nations and communities affected by malaria. And as such, you can see that uh, the industry of tea and coffee and vegetable oil and copper and cotton and so on cannot flourish in the face or with the burden of malaria that crushes the life out of tropical industry. How malaria is associated with those vultures up there flying uh, with that imply high costs and low efficiency and bad health. And also um, the leverage that um, Mr. Ross apparently was a rather difficult character and uh, had a very large ego and established the, his own institute called the Ross Institute. And here it portrays the value of the value of science and how can science be used to leverage uh, and, and, and develop the tools that can actually help societies move forward by removing the, the, the harm induced or caused by malaria. Nowadays, the distribution of malaria is still very wide. Uh, more than 40% of the world population live in countries where malaria transmission takes place. Um, but the burden due to malaria is not uniformly distributed. And this is the pictogram of, of what the prevalence of the main uh, cause of mortality due to malaria, due to plasmodium falciparum, what the world looks like in that case. And you can see Africa uh, uh, being overdimensioned, as is India, parts of Southeast Asia, and uh, the rest of the world uh, very minimally uh, represented here. Uh, the World Health Organization publishes every year its World Malaria Report, which helps track progress in the fight against malaria. It also has an app that you can freely download and um, allows us to see how the progress against malaria is uh, in saying that the last 15 years, years unprecedented progress against, again, in the fight against malaria. Um, this, the following couple of figures will, uh, will show um, um, uh, the progress since the year 2010 until the year 2018. If we even went back to the year 2000, the progress is more impactful. Um, if we had done nothing, we would be having about a million uh, deaths per year right now but we only, in inverted commas, only have 400,000 uh, uh, 400, um, uh, deaths. And um, if, um, if we hadn't done anything, we would be having 320 million cases and we only, again, in inverted commas, have 228 million. So the last, the last decade, the last 15 years have seen unprecedented progress overall. If we go back to the year 2000, mortality rates have decreased by over 60%, morbidity rates by over 40%, and never before have we seen anything like that. However, um, the last couple of years or three years, we have seen that progress um, stalling um, and, um, and uh, starting to see risks of potential reversal of those gains. Reasons for that may be um, linked to the fact that international funding to support the global fight has flatlined, and that's what your figure on the left-hand side shows. Uh, we're about three billion dollars uh, uh, being invested every year. Um, uh, the endemic countries themselves, that's the pink part of the figure on the left-hand side, uh, contribute with uh, about a third of those um, and then different donors and uh, funding mechanisms contribute to the rest. The largest donor by far, both through the bilateral route as well as multilateral route, is the US. It has shown remarkable leadership in, 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 uh, and consistency over time uh, in, in this fight. Other major donors include the UK, uh, France, the European Union and, and others. 
But uh, the message here is uh, we have seen no further progress in the uh, uh, funds made available. Uh, we have therefore flatlined and this results in that we still maintain significant coverage gaps. So within our core interventions, we have been able to scale up over the last decade, but we're now at the stage where we barely managed to replace existing commodities. And thus, it is not entirely surprising that we see no further progress and that we stall at that still unacceptable level of more than 200 million cases and more than 400,000 deaths, which is, from a malaria perspective, great progress, but it remains absolutely unacceptable. And of course, when we now see the impact of other diseases, including COVID-19, we can just imagine what, what um, 400,000 or half a million deaths or until not that long ago, close to a million deaths every year in the poorest sectors of our global community, what does that imply? I'll make reference to a couple of documents, the, the World Health Organization Global Technical Strategy endorsed by all countries in the World Health Assembly of 2015 that charts the way for the, the next 15 years and the sustainable development goals, which speak uh, specifically also to um, the need to end uh, the epidemics of malaria, TB and HIV. The global technical strategy sets a, a, a set of goals um, and uh, sets targets for 2030. The first two goals speak to disease and mortality rates uh, being uh, decreased by the numbers you can see in the screen by 2030, 2025 and 2020. The last two goals speak to uh, the uh, need or the elimination of malaria from given countries, what we would technically call the interruption of transmission and preventing once we have achieved that, that transmission gets re-established. We have pretty ambitious goals both for uh, disease and mortality reductions, as well as elimination. Moving forward quickly, starting with the good news is that, yeah, countries are progressing, which means getting to zero. And in the left hand graph, more than half of all the cases, which but because uh, being um, uh, within reach of malaria elimination. The blue line down uh, shows that at least 24 of them have less than 10 cases per year, and those are really within very close reach. When a country achieves malaria elimination and uh, remains free for three years, they can be certified malaria free by WHO, and that's what's happening uh, in, a, in, a, in a fast rate right now. Paraguay, uh, the first country in the Americas since uh, since uh, 1972 was recently certified malaria free as was algeria the first country in the afro region uh, again since the early 1970s have been certified malaria free so very good news coming from the elimination space however on the on the disease and mortality space the news are not that good the blue dotted line shows the progress that we've been making over the last uh, 15 years you will notice the last uh, four points, five points, since 2014 up to 2018, uh, no signs of progression. The green dotted line shows the trajectory we should have been following since 2015 if we were to meet our uh, goal of 2030. And uh, the light blue dotted line shows the trajectory we're actually following and thus the delta between the two shows how we are departing from the trajectory we should be following and thus we're clearly not on track to meet our agreed upon targets and goals the red dotted line is what trajectory we should would be following if we uh, reverse to uh, incidence rates that we saw um, just a few years ago so this is the malaria world Today, uh, in dark uh, uh, green, countries that are um, uh, 
have reached zero cases. So particularly I'll call out uh, China and Iran and, uh, and Malaysia um, and, um, and El Salvador, a very small country you can see there. Um, but uh, the darker colored ones, the, the dark red and, uh, and pink show were, the, were most of the malaria burden concentrates, which not surprisingly, it's in, South, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And when you actually look, and that's partly a function of population uh, size, um, 11 countries alone, 10 in Sub-Saharan Africa plus India, account for 70% of the global burden of disease. Um, this is what has led WHO trying to help us get back on track and launch what we've called the high burden, high impact approach. I won't uh, dwell a lot on that because I, a, it may get a little bit technical, but uh, also I'm uh, way beyond my uh, planned time. Sorry about that. I see kids uh, smiling at me. Um, but uh, builds on four key pillars. I'll call out a couple of them, but hey, I'll call out the, the four. The, the first one is there must be political will because that must translate into investments and that's not from the donor community alone, but also from the affected countries themselves. Um, uh, the fourth one is the need for a much more coordinated response than what has happened up to now. And I'll specifically talk to this, uh, the middle two ones, why? because um, those are areas where we're, well, we are actually very engaged in all of them, but uh, those are quite new elements. The, the, the first one is the, that we can actually use strategic, uh, that we can actually use information and data in a much more detailed way, in a much smarter way to be able to optimize the interventions we use and the mixes of interventions to achieve maximum impact and move away from what we've often called one size fits all approaches in which we do everything everywhere the same thing. Well, we can't afford to do that. And, and so use of information um, and the modeling of, of the impact that different mixes of the different tools we have would achieve according to a whole set of parameters is, is a really important element that we are spearheading and, uh, and we hope to see this. This is just a, a few sets of maps with different layers of interventions. This is Ghana specifically. Um, the second thing is we're trying to improve on, on the quality and the usefulness of the guidance that WHO gives to countries in um, uh, planning and implementing their malaria control efforts. A couple of words on uh, the tools we have. And I'll call out specifically one. We do have uh, uh, treatment, uh, diagnosis and treatment uh, of uh, sick patients. We have vector control to kill uh, mosquitoes or reduce the chances of infective mosquitoes being in touch with humans. And this can be either through the use of insecticide through the bed nets or spraying the walls of the houses with a, um, an insecticide that has a residual capacity. And um, the use of drugs through chemo prevention, which is not aiming to treat cases, but rather prevent infections. And these are, uh, can be done in children, pregnant women, or young infants. And I'll say a couple of words uh, because uh, about vaccines. Why? Because none of these tools that you see here are wonderful tools. They're reasonably imperfect. But when once we use imperfect tools even in an imperfect way in the right combination we can achieve significant impact and we can prevent as we have done over the last decade over seven million deaths but we need new tools and the search for a vaccine has been often termed one of the holy grails of modern science and uh, we have one now vaccine uh, the so-called rtss aso one developed by gsk um, that again is a, 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 an imperfect tool. It has modest efficacy, 39% reduction in clinical malaria, 30%, 29% in severe malaria, 61% in re, uh, reducing severe malaria anemia. And uh, you may say, well, that's not a lot, but this is, this is the first vaccine against a human parasite. And uh, parasites are a lot more complex biologically than either bacteria or viruses. 
And a tool like this one could actually um, uh, be a useful addition to our toolkit of different tools, not to be used alone, but in combination of all other ones. Following a, a policy uh, um, and a favorable uh, opinion by the European Medicines Agency, which is the equivalent to a regulatory mechanism, uh, WHO uh, is spearheading uh, what we call pilot implementation programs in three countries with the support of key international partners. And uh, in the last year, over 270,000 children in Africa, in Malawi, Ghana, and, um, and Kenya have been immunized. Uh, this will help generate information over the next uh, three or four years um, that uh, will hopefully uh, facilitate the further um, use of this vaccine in other countries. Coming towards the end of this uh, far too long uh, talk, what does COVID-19 mean um, to our fight against malaria? Well, first of all, it's still early days thinking particularly of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we're seeing uh, the massive uh, health impact of uh, COVID-19 in, in Asia, uh, parts of Asia, in Europe and, and in the US. Um, it is still early days of the pandemic in Africa and, uh, and thus we will need to wait and see how, what, uh, how it evolves. Not just thinking about uh, climatic conditions, because I think we're now quite clear that COVID-19 can spread in the face of warm weather. But uh, given that the demographics in Africa are quite different to what they are in Europe, um, the morbidities or cofactors that are relevant for severity of disease and death are different. Um, in Africa, uh, young children uh, with malaria, with anemia, with um, intestinal parasites, with uh, pneumonias, uh, may have other comorbidities that may facilitate or, uh, or, 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 or be cofactors for severity of this disease. We still need to see the economic impact, the social impact and service disruptions, the impact on development partners um, and whether international cooperation will continue at the same level. Uh, and thus the funding for global health. So I think it's important to use, uh, as the, to stand as a disclaimer, we still don't know what's gonna happen, but we have to prepare for the worst. And as such today, actually, um, uh, we are releasing, um, and I, it was embargoed until I think a, an hour ago, a large uh, modeling work that WHO has uh, led together with uh, partners from, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the MAP program at the University of Oxford and, uh, and at PATH and the Imperial College and others in which we've been trying to estimate what, how would service disruptions in Africa impact on malaria, in other words, the indirect impact on malaria. We've looked at different scenarios in terms of uh, disrupting delivery, uh, disruptions in delivery of vector control tools, or seasonal malaria chemo prevention or access to diagnosis and treatment and um, and i won't dwell on this a lot but suffice to say that um, there are a number of scenarios which we believe are quite likely depending on how the COVID evolves in which increases in mortality and this is what um, we see here could range between um, I mean, in the lower cases from 7%, but all the way up to 102%. And um, what, this, what this could mean, and um, this is what this table uh, far too crowded shows, is that if you look at the, uh, uh, the upper figure of number of cases in Sub-Saharan Africa, currently running at 215 million per year, we could go up to 261 million cases. And if we look at deaths uh, right now running in Sub-Saharan Africa at 386,000, we could go up to 768,000 deaths just due to malaria. No, this is not COVID-related. Um, uh, within 2020, and this is within this year. So, and this is how it is likely to impact different countries in terms of increases in, in, in mortality. And um, none of the pictures are nice or good. 
but there are a few countries where we could be seeing increases above 100 percent in current mortality rates and that includes as you see i'm from angola to cote d'ivoire um, Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is a huge worry because uh, Nigeria alone is about a fifth or, of all the African population of Sub-Saharan Africa and, and others. So we are celebrating World Malaria Day on Saturday. So uh, all the messaging today and tomorrow is around World Malaria Day. It's going to be very much focused on on the need to preserve malaria control activities in the face of COVID-19. It can be done in a safe way. We have issued very specific um, um, guidance that you can see down in your picture down there of how to tailor malaria interventions in the COVID-19 response and thus try to make, mitigate what could become an indirect massive devastating effect of uh, COVID-19. So with that, I thank you very much and sorry for have taken far too long. So over to you. Thank you, Pedro. Really appreciate it. Um, so we've received in quite a few questions. Um, so we'll just start with Steve Griffiths, who's actually popped through a few. Um, let me just find him and I'll unmute him for you. Um, and then he'll be able to sort of ask you any questions. Hi, Steve. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for this very clear and, and fascinating presentation. Uh, just going back to deaths from malaria, could you just tell us briefly who dies of malaria? Um, what's the pattern of, of mortality? Is it mainly among kids? Is it among the socially, uh, economically active? Is there variation between countries? So, Steve, if you can hear me, I, I lost you for a few seconds or milliseconds but i believe your question was uh, essentially who dies of malaria and does this change from one place to another um, um in most of deaths due to malaria in the world take place in sub-saharan africa and this happens uh, among uh, children typically less than five six years of age the reason for that being that there is high transmission of malaria and thus children are the first ones um, they get infected early on they die early on and so adults in africa by and large have uh, are the survivors of malaria and thus have immunity in areas where there is uh, less transmission like would be the case okay, including southeast asia india latin america uh, often occupational uh, forest growers in Southeast Asia and other places and uh, and their generally mortality is a lot lower but so thinking of mortality we think of of young African children and pregnant women and pregnant women. women because of pregnancy particularly in the first and second pregnancy lose some of their immunity acquire the immunity to malaria and are then again at higher risk of of malaria during the pregnancy and the implications of that to to uh, the newborn also thank you that's really helpful um <clears throat> two kind of related questions in terms of uh, control efforts uh, so one would be what kind of impact is global warming having on malarial control i.e is malaria spreading into areas uh, because the vector can now live there because of global warming uh, then a related question, just in terms of control programs, what kind of impact do you think the US president's recent announcement of funding withdrawal from the WHO will have on the malaria program? Thank you. So global warming, um, as you can imagine, I get that question um, quite often. And uh, I'm always really sorry having to give the same answer because I'd love to be able to show that uh, malaria is likely to be um, uh, facilitated, uh, sorry, that um, global warming may facilitate malaria and therefore put it as part of the risk. But we have no real evidence that that will be the case. So our different estimates and models um, which of course are models and, and there's a significant levels of uncertainty speak to in some areas it may mm, 
provoking increased transmission. Often the impact of, of uh, global warming may be an indirect one by creating areas of drought and uh, migration of populations into other areas. But from the biological standpoint, at this point, we don't think it is going to be a major driver of, of malaria transmission. I know it sounds counterintuitive, and uh, it would be great for our advocacy if we could actually link the two, but unfortunately, um, we don't have the data to do so. In terms of the US and, uh, and the fight against malaria, you know, um, it was President, President George W. Bush that established the large international um, cooperation programs in the field of, of HIV, what is called the PEPFAR program, and in the field of malaria, that's called the President's Malaria Initiative. So, um, and uh, this pro those programs were kept through uh, the Obama administration. I think it's probably fair to say that uh, uh, in the current U.S. administration, um, uh, the White House has sent to uh, Congress uh, budgets that implied significant cuts on uh, to funding multilateral agencies and funding uh, um, global health initiatives. Um, the good news is that uh, in the U.S. Congress, there's a very strong bipartisan support for these initiatives. And as you know, in the end, in the U.S., it's actually Congress that makes the budget. It's not, it's not, it's not really the, the White House. And so the Appropriation Committee has, often, has always actually reversed the cuts that the, that the, the White House had actually sent. So we're hopeful that uh, that bipartisan support for global health in Congress will, will maintain the engagement of the U.S., which is absolutely essential. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, next, we have Felix Appleby, who, who popped through a few questions by email. Uh, let me just unmute him one sec. Hi, Felix. Can you hear us? Um, I can. Hold on. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. I can't remember exact wording, but my question is this. That surely this COVID virus was not started by some bat's wing eating bat's wings in a Chinese market. Have they been eating bat's wings and other live animals for centuries? And I wonder whether it isn't a leak from a lab in China either intentionally or unintentionally. I would also like to know what the WHO view on that is. And also, perhaps pointedly, forgive me saying so, but WHO is here for world health. Why didn't they spot this earlier? That's my basic question. All right, thanks. Um, um, people have been eating bats, surely, probably. Um, um, so what is the origin of, of the virus? Um, there are several, or there are multiple, there are hundreds of viruses out there in, 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 um, in animals. Um, HIV probably came from uh, a monkey virus, and uh, they eventually jump into onto uh, humans, uh, and that probably happens hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of times every day. Uh, the problem is when the that jump of that virus or that actually there's, we have the same in in, in malaria uh, can actually. Uh, live within the new species, so the interspecies jump is, it happens, but it doesn't es establish itself, and then on top of that, it gets transmitted, and that's what is very, very rare, but it can happen, and when it happens, then we have a problem. I'll be very, I'll be very frank with you. I don't. Uh, I, there is zero evidence uh, that this was created in any lab. That this is man created. Um, there is actually very strong evidence that that is not the case, uh, that this came jumped from, from a bat. Probably, it's not even that someone ate a bat, but that a bat ate or licked uh, a fruit, which they love fruits, and then some, a human uh, ate it straight after that. 
So there are multiple ways of, of, of the virus jumping from, from, from a bat to, to a human. I'm, I, I really don't think that there is any evidence uh, uh, on, on, on this being created. The risk of this is a uh, conspiracy theories, and worse than that, when if if as uh, the director general of WHO Tedros uh, has said, when when the, the, there is an attempt to politicize the virus, and then then th things really go really go wrong. Now, the WHO spotted earlier. Well, WHO um, um, reports what it gets from countries. We don't have our antennas on on the ground. And uh, it can be discussed, and I think there will be the, the time to do a, a full audit and see could things uh, have been done better. And, uh, and I think that that's good practice, and I think it, 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 will, it will be done. And, uh, and it will be done, A, to, to, to learn, and thus improve for the future, and B, should there have been any wrongdoing, to, to correct it. But... If you also allow me in a, in a frank and family conversation like this one, I think that um, for all we know, and I think we do know a lot, um, the leadership of China was uh, uh, told about this at the very, very end of, of December. And uh, WHO was notified on the 31st of December. And that same day, there is already tracking of uh, messages from WHO being shared with countries about around a very small cluster of unusual bilateral pneumonias. The first official statement from WHO is of January the 5th. The uh, virus was isolated a few days later and uh, sequenced, and I think the sequence of the virus was put on internet, I think within less than five days. And uh, Wuhan was... Uh, I was actually in China at the time, and Wuhan was closed, I think it was on January the 20th. So generally, I would say the speed at which um, uh, the community has reacted, and in this case, the Chinese, community, the Chinese have uh, reacted, has been significant. The World Health Organization declared this as a public health emergency of international concern, which is the highest level of alert on January the 30th. So less than 30 or 30 days after the first um, um, uh, uh, report was shared with the organization and when there were, I think, less than 100 cases outside of China and zero deaths outside of China. So, as I say, there is there, no, not to be seen to corporate. I, 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 I'm always all for uh, uh, full investigations being done and audits being done, and I, I absolutely think that it should be done. But in this case, uh, in this case, I, I think the, the 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 speed of reaction has been reasonable. Could it be that there were more deaths in China than what originally reported? Probably. Uh, I mean, we're seeing it in Europe these days. Uh, in Europe, every country counts deaths in a different way. Um, uh, the French and the Spaniards, and I believe the Brits, have not been reporting deaths that take place at, uh, at old people's homes, um, which probably account for at least a third of all the deaths due to COVID-19. So the deaths that we're reporting, we're seeing in Europe probably represents a massive underestimate of, well, a massive, a very significant underestimate of all the deaths that are taking place. So we just have, we have a lot of challenges. But I think in this space, and I know it has become very politicized, um, the, the, the speed of reaction and the speed of transparency from our Chinese was, was, was probably quite, quite adequate. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Um, I think next, uh, we may have time for just one or two more questions, but John Evans, um, he popped a question in the chat. I'll just unmute you now. Hi there. Hi, it's John Evans from uh, AC 1987 to 89. So um, the question is, is it possible to develop a vaccine that's suitable for both adults and children, or is the aim to only um, vaccinate at a young age? Thanks. 
So, John, I presume you're on malaria vaccines. I mean, on malaria, vac yeah. um, on malaria vaccines, part of the problem of this being caused by a human malaria parasite with a very complex life cycle and one uh, that goes through different stages within the, 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 the human host and um, which, uh, and each stage has a, a different, um, uh, induces different immunity, um, which what we would call stage specific immunity. And in turn, that has different impacts in terms of disease and death reductions or infection reductions. Uh, we're dealing with a, a, a complex one. Um, ideally, one would be able to have a, a, a universal vaccine against what we would call the pre-erythrocytic stage, the first stage in the infection of the parasite in the human. And that one would be useful for, if it was highly efficacious, would be useful for all age groups. For reasons that we still don't entirely understand, uh, the current vaccine, which is essentially a pre-erythrocytic vaccine, uh, only confers partial immunity. And uh, given the fact that it's only a partial immunity, it only appears to be useful in children. And thus, this is a vaccine that we're only targeting for uh, children, as it appears to have poor efficacy in adults, and therefore its biggest use is in lowering the amount of deaths due to malaria among, among children. So conceptually, one could actually develop it for all age groups, a universal vaccine. In this case, it's one that it was originally being developed by the US military to protect um, US military personnel and eventually could be used for tourists. Clearly that is not the case. But interestingly, the, the consequence is that it can actually be a rather useful vaccine for children. Great. Thank you, John. Um, I, I think we have time for one more question. Um, let me just try one second. <clears throat> um, Eladio, uh, if you are there, I'll unmute you now. One second, please. Hi, Eladio. Hi there. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Pedro. It's a pleasure to um, hear you. Um, my question is the following one. Can you hear me? Very yes. well, Eladio. I'm yes. very happy to hear you. Yes. Can, can any of the lessons learned, uh, uh, do you think, uh, Pedro, for malaria uh, be applied to fight the COVID-19, um, you know, it, it, could we apply some sort of a, a sort of an approach of lessons learned, or are they very different animals at this uh, stage? Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Ladio. I'm very happy to hear you. As I said, um, there are common principles in epidemiology and public health that are applicable to the two. As, but as you rightly say, they're very different animals. They're very different creatures. That the, the, the virus and uh, of which we still don't know a lot, and 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 um, and the human malaria parasites. But um, but there are things that are, as I say, of, of common uh, common approaches. Uh, good public health, good epidemiology, good uh, collection of data, which is one thing that we have a big problem generally in COVID-19, and, and I would say particularly in Spain, uh, in terms of, uh, of the quality of the data. That is equally essential for malaria, and uh, we very much recognize, and actually, as I showed, how can data much better inform our public health action is, is an approach that we're very strongly pushing in malaria pre-COVID-19. Um, um, uh, the machinery and the science machinery and the industrial machinery required for production of vaccines. Interestingly, some of the drugs or the medicines that are being used to prevent or treat COVID infection, for which we still don't have sufficient evidence, are old anti-malarial drugs. Many of you will have heard about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, uh, um, uh, being uh, used for the prevention or treatment of COVID. 
to the point that it has actually created massive shortages globally. These are all malaria medicines. Med mefloquine is also being used now in some settings to, um, to treat COVID infection. That's also an antimalarial medicine. Pyronaridine, again, same, same. So, um, so um, there are lessons, there are approaches that are common, and there may be actually tools that may be common. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Elia. Um, I think in terms of sort of any other questions that have been popped through in the chat or via email, um, we'll, we'll share them with Pedro and see if he, he have the chance to get back to them. But we'll post everything we get um, on sort of Atlantic Connect, the, uh, the alumni website page that, that can all be seen. This has also been recorded. So over the next week or so, we'll be sharing that on our YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, if any of you have any sort of questions or feedback, uh, my colleague Magda has popped that in the chat as well. Um, if you could fill out the form, that'd be great. Um, and finally, if you're interested in giving a talk um, or have any sort of thoughts or recommendations of one of your classmates or someone you work with or know that might be interested in giving a talk, um, do let us know. You can pop through an email to join in at atlanticcollege.org. Um, but yeah, we're really excited that this series of events has now kicked off. Um, we have the next one coming up in about two weeks, but we'll be sending out details on that shortly um, and we'll share the invite with everyone. Uh, but yeah, any questions or any thoughts, uh, just let any myself or anyone from the PPE team know. Um, but once again, I want to say thank you to Pedro. We really, really appreciate him um, sort of having the time today to give us a talk. So thanks a lot. Um, and we want to thank everyone for, for joining in. We're really excited that this is kicking off and um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if Andrea has anything to say, but thanks a lot to everyone. Just to thank Pedro, really. Thank you so much for helping us to launch this new initiative. It, it was fantastic, your talk, really interesting. And we hope that more people join us. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Uh, if I can answer questions, I'll be happy to do so. Perhaps also share, I, I hate Twitter, but uh, I'm, I have to use Twitter apparently as, as a director in WHO. So uh, in my Twitter account, I, I do regularly post up things on malaria and now malaria and COVID-19. Fantastic. It's in, the, it's, in the, it's in the final slide of, my, of, my, of, of the slide deck. So thank you very much and, uh, and goodbye to all of you. Bye, thank you very much. Thank Cheers. Everyone. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Yes, thank you. Bye.